You know, and, and I don't know if you know, but I'm a grandmaster in martial arts, so I've been teaching martial arts for as long time. So if you ever want to help work on that too, with you and your people in your church, I'm be warned, give you service, please. Yeah, that's interesting. So thank you for sharing that. I hadn't thought about that. So as we get right in here, this I'm Dr. Paul. This is Bridges Live. It comes on iHeart and Apple Podcasts and all your podcast channel and stations. And it's also going live on YouTube and in Facebook. But that's you can always inbox us and catch up later with the information that you might you think you've missed and that you want to hear more of. So I want to introduce um, a friend of mine, Ricky, jo Ricky Jones. Um, he's many things. He's an attorney. He's a, he, he, he pastors a church. But please, Ricky, tell us about yourself because I want to get into the writ and I want to talk about it slowly so people can get the gravity of what's going on. I see. Okay, well, I'm a pastor of a church in Columbia and I've also been a, an attorney. Uh, civil rights is one of the main areas that I cover for approximately 30 years now. But I have a, because I represent the church, I have a diverse multi-state law practice. And what I mean by that is that everything church people need, I take care. And not just in the state of Maryland, New York, New Jersey, Ohio, Louisiana, Tennessee, because I have family, because my, the members uh, of, of the churches who, who I represent, they have families in other states. And sometimes they trust the man of God, who's a lawyer more than anybody. So I have actually gone out of the state of Maryland to represent people, state court, federal court, everything, at least 15 areas of the law that I, I actually practice in. Um, I have a, I can give you with, um, contracts towards business law, law and, uh, wills and estates, family law, juvenile law, immigration, legal malpractice, medical malpractice, sports law. I was an NBA agent and an NFL, and an NFL agent. Uh, medical, um, church law, administrative law, real estate, criminal law, and civil rights. And so those are kind of the areas I have been focusing on just to help church people. And people may not know, but church people have some of the same issues as people outside the church. And that's why my practice is so broad and so expansive. Uh, I've written legal articles have been published nationwide at least seven times. And I have both served as a panelist on a continuing legal education class at multiple bar associations, as well as organized them. So God has blessed me in a wonderful way to have a great deal of diverse multi-state legal knowledge experience and scholarship. So um, concerning, go ahead, I'm sorry. You know, we, you know and, I, and I don't want to take away from, because the church is the community, we need to help service on all levels. <clears throat> it's not just I, spiritually, it's also mentally, emotionally, physically, right? And, yes. and, and if that's what, and, and if that's where we can get our help and our love and our c compassion from, because I don't think a lot of churches either let people know who's in the church that could help them or have that type. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just not that informed about the churches or how people work in the church. So I wonder if other people have that same feeling in their church that they. Can we're in a different day now. You know, we're in a different day now. And when it comes to church people, I, ha I have to say this. Many times church people, especially people mature in Christ in terms of God's word and knowledgeable, trying to live it every day. Mm -hmm. They take a lot before they actually come to a lawyer. And mm. so by the time they get to me, they're so beaten down that many times, man, I just have to pray with them to lift them up. And then we deal with the legal part without any hesitation, reservation or shortcomings. And so uh, you'll be surprised at how valuable it is to have a man of God who's also a lawyer to help church people. It's very invaluable. And even though my practice is unique, it should not be. Well, you know, going back to the civil rights and, and the Southern law and how it all pretty much started was this is a way we can do both. We can minister to our people and yet we can walk them into court because <clears throat> so I think you're, you're pretty much stayed along the course of the civil rights attorney. Yeah, it, 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 it's really simple. It's like a hand inside of a glove when you love the church and you've grown up in the church like mm -hmm. I have my whole life. From the time of my care of me when I came out the hospital, the church has been everything to me. And that has not changed. Uh, by by the, by virtue of the fact that I'm an attorney, it still it still is everything to me. And about probably about a good ninety, maybe ninety five percent of my clients come from the church. I have pastor friends, and when they have members in trouble, you know. So basically, it's been a tremendous blessing for me for my practice. Or uh, it's been a it's been a, um, a very peaceful practice because I don't have to fight church people to represent them like you have to do non church folk. <laughs> right. I don't believe in fighting people to help them. So usually when they come to me, their pastor referred them to me or something along those lines. So I have a beautiful relationship and a beautiful practice approaching 30 years. So let's get into the red. Black attorneys, lawyers in Maryland, and you may have known the other states too, and please mention it, having the most darndest time 
being allowed to even run to become a judge in Maryland and in Arundel County. What's going on? Yeah, this is what's going on, sir. And I'm going to start off, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be too technical, but let me just say something here. Uh, when people hear the word systemic racism, let me just kind of say what it is to really get to what I'm trying to say here. Systemic racism is basically policies and practices that sweep the entire society and are designed to be advantageous to Caucasians and harmful to non-Caucasians on a continuous basis. The judiciary puts an exclamation point on systemic racism. And the reason why I say that is because even though uh, some of us can go to court and be successful at times, the majority of times we will not be successful against a Caucasian opponent. And this is what, what systemic racism is all about. What's going on now is there are some African-Americans like myself who have applied for vacancies. In terms of experience, we can stop talking. My law office is the research on every judge who's ever sat on the circuit court for Anne the County, and none of them have had legal articles published nationwide seven times, served as a teacher for continuing legal education classes. None of them have practiced by multi-state law practice, state, federal, representing people in 15 different areas, none of them. So we're not talking, we can't even have a conversation about legal knowledge, experience, and scholarship. That's not even a conversation. What we have going on is Caucasians who've been in private practice for a year and a half, mm -hmm. being recommended to the governor, put on the bench when Reverend Jones is sitting here, practicing almost 30 years in 15 different areas all around the country, and I won't even get a recommendation to the governor. That is preposterous, sir. So, and so, this is what you call systemic racism. And so, and, and so for, the, for, the, for the slower people in the audience, someone has to recommend you to the governor of the state for you to be put on the ballot. That's correct. It's called the Judicial Nominating Commission. Uh, they make recommendations. They're set up. Um, usually the governor will put those who you like on there. And so as you just set up that way, it's kind of, as a matter of fact, it's political significantly. It is. Political. And so what happens is, you know, you'll, you'll recommend folk that the governor, you know, the governor likes these types. If it's a Republican governor, they probably recommend Republicans, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Not always, but a lot of times that's kind of the bit there. But the key is that the the qualifications require that you recommend the most legally qualified. That's in writing. The most, M-O-S-T, legally qualified. That's objective, sir. That's not subjective. They have tossed that in the trash can. And this thing has been subjective for so long. For Maryland, for, for Anne Arundel County's entire almost 400-year history, they've excluded non-Caucasians, not just African-Americans, but I'm talking about... Uh, Asians, Pacific Islanders, even those of mixed racial heritage, black and white, they've excluded all of them from the circuit court for Anne Arundel County at 99.97%. Sir, this is def this is discrimination by definition, and it is outrageous. So what happens is, if somebody wants to get on the bench from our community, not only do you have to do you have to uh, uh, sit through an interview, but then the judicial nominating commission must recommend you to the governor. Right. I don't recommend to you to the governor. Almost 100% of the time, the governor will choose from those that are recommended to him. And so if they don't recommend it, recommend you to the governor, it's like a preliminary step of excluding you before the governor even sees you. That has, and what does that have to do with the most legally qualified? It has zero to do with that. So the Judicial Nominating Commission has now become a farce in terms of objective criteria and they're just doing this thing subjectively and putting on the bench who they want to put on. And here's the thing. Who picks the Judiciary Committee anyway? Who, who the picks? Governor, the, governor, the governor mainly will, will have people on there. And some of, some of the bar associations will make recommendations as well. But a lot of times it's part of the system, sir. And the thing mm. about it is that's so wicked and offensive is that where does objective criteria come in? Correct. You see, they're always talking about in the newspaper, they vetted this particular person mm -hmm. and the governor put them on the bench. So they, they portray mm -hmm. that they're engaging in a meritorious evaluation when, in fact, they're doing the extreme opposite. So the Judicial Nominating Commission was the basis of my lawsuit and the basis of my writ of certiorari before the United States Supreme Court. I was attacking the process, trying to get them to revamp the process to let objective criteria govern and not subjective stuff. And so my whole lawsuit... And my appeal to the United States Supreme Court was about this system legally cannot stand based on our discrimination laws. And I gave them the law. I gave them the statistics. I had it all, sir. There's no way in the world the United States Supreme Court, if they had 
decide to hear that case could have ruled any other way but to but to trash that because it is so unfair, so racist, it's systemic racism by definition. But and the, so what we have going on is this has been going on continuously, not just in Anaheim County, but with the exception of PG County and Baltimore City, it's going around on around the entire state and around the country. This is what systemic racism is, just in case anyone ever wondered what it is, this is what it is. Those policies and practices that sweep the entire country that continuously is advantageous to Caucasians and harmful to non-Caucasians. That's systemic racism. And the judiciary is the best example I can think of in the 21st century. Why did they not hear it yet? How does it get kicked? Yeah, but the United States Supreme Court only hears man, so they, many. They have, they have total discretion. Right. They don't hear a lot of the writs. Correct. And so the only thing you could do is, is make as powerful of an argument and as persuasive of an, of an argument as you can. And I sent you my writ. I if did. You read the I read writ, and if you read the writ, sir, there's absolutely nothing that could dissuade them from hearing this other than the judiciary having no stomach to change things. That's mm. systemic racism. And it, it, the same thing happened in the state courts. They just have no stomach to change things. They talk equity, talk justice. But when it comes down to really taking steps to make things just and equitable, you will find them going in the opposite direction. So this is a problem for civilians, non-legal minded people who are getting pulled over, who are getting arrested, who are being accosted, who, who anything that has to do with the courts there, it's, there's not equal representation in the judicial system. So how is there going to be a free... It's not free, but how is it going to be an equal equality in the courts if there's no representation? Is that possible? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge, sir. Uh, the, the reason why I know I've been successful with you know, 30 years representing church people is because we go in there with Jesus, to just be blunt about it. And he has been very... Uh, uh, he's been a heart of all my success. Nobody but going in there with Jesus by my side, being honest mm -hmm. 100% without compromise, and also walking in that courtroom not playing with anybody, not the judge, not the jury, the other opposing counsel. I don't believe in playing in the courtroom, sir. And so I believe because I've had Jesus with me, my clients have been with church folk. That's the only reason I can think of we've been successful, sir. But it's a challenge, sir, when you go in there and you ain't got Jesus, you ain't got no God. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't have Jesus, in my view, you got a, you got a mountain you're trying to climb, sir. And this is no this is no joke. This is some serious stuff. I can tell you some stories, man, that, that just make your, the back of your, your hair crawl because you wouldn't think that this could happen in the 21st century. Well, I do, um, I do want to hear the story because I think when I have these podcasts, these pe I think people, I, I listen to you, I talk to you, we have, we, we've, been, we've been talking a couple of times, especially on the other shows, about the, 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 the legislative bill that's going to, they're trying to get passed. And I talk to other scholarly people. I hear what's going on. I don't think a lot of people are privy to hear this stuff and be like, holy buckets. You know what I mean? It's, it's like crime in Baltimore. If you don't know the people that's the foot people in Baltimore, there's a lot of crime in Baltimore that doesn't even get reported. Mm -hmm. And that's scary. We're, we're not talking yes. about the reported crime. We're talking about the unreported crime that doesn't even right. make the newspaper. Yes. It's scary. It's that's not so. Please tell us the story so we can understand this. This is a heavy weight on my heart because it saddens me to think that where do we turn? Where where what do we do as a people? We thought we can get some equality in the court system, right? Um, maybe it's a maybe. It's maybe not so much. We thought we can get something, some equality in in the legislative process. Mm, no. <laughs> right? So we don't normally get it from the executive branch because they got too many other things to do. So where are we to turn? Is it in our corporate life? Is it our community life? I mean, so, yeah. Well, well the, the son of God to turn to Jesus. That's the first thing. Let me put that out there <laughs> to get that started. <laughs> Go out here, but I don't know what you're going to do. But that's the first thing. The second thing is, I'm going to use this writ as an example mm -hmm. in, of the type of, um, the type of flawless um, facts and law that you can have mm -hmm. and still not be successful. One of the things I did when I first began to fight this fight was I, I got my Freedom of Information Act request from the administrative officer of the course to find out what was going on. And once I found out that only white folk had been, had been recommended to the governor, he'd just been putting white folk on left and right, even though they were far less qualified objectively 
the many African Americans and others. And I, and I was looking at this story, and I, I'm thinking to myself, I was like, you know, this is for real here because mm-hmm. I'm not from this area. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. And so when I came up here, and I and I'm talking, to, uh, some attorneys called me one day after I had an interview. Uh, we have to go through a number of interviews when you when you uh, decide to apply for these judicial these judicial vacancies. And some attorneys called me and said, Reverend Jones, we want to talk to you. I said, I didn't really know him. I just kind of bumped into him during the interview. I said, well, what do you want to talk about? I said, could you just meet us at such such place? I said, sure. So I went to meet him. They got these three African-American attorneys. I mean, with just gloomy look on their faces. They said, Reverend Jones, they're keeping us out. I said, this is my first time when I first applied. I said, what do you mean they're keeping you out? I said, they won't, they won't, they won't recommend us. I said, I said, I said, slow on for a minute. So I got, he's got to register to me. Are you telling me that we're talking about raw, naked, wicked racism? Is that what we're talking about? I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, let me go do some research here. I said, but I'm ready to go forward and file a lawsuit if necessary. You know, EOC first go that route first, then file a lawsuit. And they said, well, we, have a we don't want to do that. I said, what do you mean? It was like, well, you know, why don't we talk to the NWCP and all these other people? We know judges. This same thing. I said, okay, I'll tell you what. You do whatever you do whatever you want to do. I'm not going to interfere with that. I said, but I'm not walking away from this if my research confirms what you're saying to me. Yeah. So I did my research. They, they talked to everybody. You can imagine, bro. <laughs> that didn't go anywhere, which I knew. And so when they finally exhausted everybody and nobody would really do anything, I said, are you ready to file a lawsuit? And they would not do it, sir. The fear. I'm talking about in the best of our community. Lawyers have been practicing for years and years. When the best of our community is afraid, sir, how can the community be helped? This is the reason why I traveled the route all the way to the United States Supreme Court alone on my own dime, sir, and to, to, to bring this in front of the, the United States Supreme Court. And what I brought to them, sir, in terms of statistics, after I got my, my Freedom of Information Act information, in terms of statistics, in terms of the law, in terms of the figures, sir, I don't think in almost 30 years of practice law, I've ever had that much statistical factual and logical support that the brief was flawless i had everything there was not one thing even the, the state when i was suing them in state even they missed the deadline so i asked for default judgment they wouldn't grant that they messed up procedurally they messed up factually they violated the law i had it all i kept the statistics i put it all in the brief as you read to no avail sir because the united states supreme court would not deal with it This is what you're talking about here. I've had other cases where I had people forge the deeds of my client's great grandmothers to take their lane. I get an international expert saying this is a forge. This is a forgery. You mean you've had people try to forge deeds deeds to take land away from your clients? Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. I just had a case that dealing with that kind of stuff, and I got the international expert. Got everything. They got their expert handwriting expert to say the opposite of what my expert said. So when you have that, then of course it has to be a judge decision. But I asked the expert, where well, is it possible that this is not their great grandmother's signature? He said, yes. That was the whole case, sir. Once he said it's a possibility that it's not their great grandmother's signature, and my international expert is definitely not, that weighs the balance towards my clients. That case was over. And the judge found a way to rule against my clients. This is what I'm talking about, sir. And so is this type of um, systemic racism in the, ju- in the judiciary? As I said the last time on your show, the judiciary is one of the last bastions of Jim Crow practices in America right. in the 21st century, sir. And folk don't seem to understand it or they don't know about it, but this is serious business. And until not only do we have to write our legislators about this trial court judicial nominating commission and the judi- appellate court judicial nominating commission, to, 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 to just trash that thing. Because mm-hmm. that has not been about objective merit whatsoever. And they keep and bringing also, it back every year. They keep trying to bring this law back. They try to keep past this every year. Because they want to put a stop to it all. Yeah. See, if they remove, if they, if they remove contested elections for the circuit for Anne Arundel County, sir, do you know it's going to be almost impossible to get that reversed? Yeah. So they don't want us to run. If, we, if they're not appointing us, the only other chance we have of getting on the bench is to run in the election. I spent, I ran about three times. I spent about, I spent almost $20,000 of my own money running, sir. And what happened was not only that I didn't come in last place, but I came in pretty close to last place. And one of the, the, the major obstacles I faced was I was running to people from our community who didn't See. even know See. me. Not, yeah. I, I'm spending money and money. I'm advertising. I got telephone calls going. I mean, I spent a lot of my own money. And, they, and they was, I remember this brother, I was at the, at the poll, the brother came out, said, man, I said, I'm sure I hope you, you're voting for me, man. We're trying to get us on the, on the bench so we can be fair with everybody. And he almost cried. He said, I didn't vote for you because I didn't know you. 
So we got to make sure we get ourselves informed during these elections mm-hmm. to know who's running, especially from our community, especially a man of God who's going to treat everybody in a just and fair manner. You can't miss that, sir. See the problem. Be- the thing is, the thing is, is and, and you know you run this as you ran as you ran for a campaign to get someone informed. They must have to at least open their ears to yes, wa- to yes, want sir. to hear. And, yes, sir. And there's our flaw. We're trying to wake them up in a heartstrings, compassionate and soulful, and they're closed off by fear. You said this earlier. Even the other attorneys were so afraid, and yes, in sir. that fear. I still think a lot of black communities and black population live in such a fear survival mode that they never see joy. And then, and if you can't see joy, there's nothing to rejoice. And if you can't rejoice, then how do you have grace? It's, 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 a, it's, it's a tragedy, sir, that we have the cream of our crop in our community of free. Uh, you know, God is not giving us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1, 7. And fear makes up no part of my DNA. But I will tell you this as well. Not only do uh, my opponents who are, are coming against the court know there's no fear, no compromise with Reverend Jones, but the judges know. It. And I'm going to tell you how I know that. Uh, we just moved to our present location as a church, but the previous location we were at, the only one wanted the property. So I said, fine. So I said, I said we'll move. God's going to God his church. So we got a, a place 10 times better. But before we left, the owner of the of the building, he said, he said Reverend Jones, got to talk to you for a minute. I said, sure. So I went, I took him to my office. He came to the office. Man, this man told me, he said, Reverend Jones, I know a lot of judges, because he got a lot of money, you know. Mm-hmm. He said, I know a lot of judges, man. He said, and I went to them and I asked them, do you know Reverend Ricky Nelson Jones? He told me out the clear blue, I don't know why the man told me. He said, he said, Reverend Jones, he said, when I asked him, they said, oh, yes, we know him, and we don't want him over here with us. We want him to stay over there. Mm-hmm. So what I'm saying is that the devil knows God's servant mm-hmm. and a person who stands for what is right and just for all people without compromise and without fear. So I'm able to speak so freely because fear makes up no part of my DNA, sir. Mm-hmm. But that's extremely rare to find. I have yet to find it in other attorneys. I mean, I'm, I'm literally in front of the circle and I'm on the county with a, with, a, with a sign protesting, bro. And we can't get the cream of the crop of our community to stop being afraid. Stop acting like you're tongue-tied. What did you mind on blackball? You're already blackballed. That's the guy putting us on the bench now. So we have got to overcome this fear. And I pray people bow to Jesus, man, because he will give you the courage to stand for what is just and right. And also, I don't have to tell you, Dr. Dyer, man, I'm from the traditional Baptist church down in New Orleans, Louisiana, the deep <laughs> south. I mean, I'm, I'm in the vein of the Martin Luther King, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, but man, we don't think about no fear. Yeah. Somebody told me, Reverend Jones, if you fight and go with the United States Supreme Court, you may never get on the bench. What does that mean to me? I'm not yeah. on it now. You're right, right. It makes um, no sense. We are free about the wrong thing. You know, that's why things don't change faster, sir. You know, and then if God moves me to run again, man, I need all the community to come out and support. Who wouldn't want a judge who is fair and just to all people? That's what the judiciary is all about. People can bring their, their disputes there and get a fair and just adjudication of them. So we, we we got so much of the opposite of that now. Here's that we can be the outrage. Sir. Here's here's the hard question, and the hard question is is you have minorities, blacks, um, um, Latin America over here, but if white America doesn't think that this is worthy enough for them to put an eye and ear to. Just some of them, a quarter of them, it still doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, but we have we have some white people who are who are not wicked and evil. And Correct. Correct. So so we do as as we know from the civil rights movement. So we do have people. I think a lot of times um, they either they either they are uninformed or they're not really that concerned about the judiciary. You I, know, think we, we, not, we, I think they're just not concerned. I think that's what it's because yeah. if you inform them, they'll be like, oh, you know. But I just think they're just not informed. And they don't right. want to be informed because they may have other things. And I don't want hasty to generalize because no, it's not different yeah. than Christian Caucasians. You know what I'm saying? It's just a matter of getting getting people to realize, uh, as my friend, uh, the Reverend Dr. Emmett C. Burns, a former Maryland delegate, uh, pastor of Rising Sun Baptist Church over, over there in Baltimore County, he told me, he said, I'm from Mississippi, man. He said, I know racism. He said, and racism is not going anywhere. It's like a block of ice. A block of ice. It's not going anywhere unless you put some fire in it. And we got to understand both both uh, black and white folk of goodwill and a desire for justice and, and, and equal treatment. 
We got to understand the need to push our senators when somebody runs from our community or of, of, of somebody else who has a heart for what is just right. We got to get out and support them. I mean, you'd be surprised how difficult it was for me to get people to just, 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 just give me some time. Let me, let me explain to you, you know, what it is a Reverend Jones can bring to the bench compared to what you've been getting. And it's just difficult a lot of times. Man, is, you know? is there a way we can get like the mayor involved if, 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 if he or she or them are there behind it? I mean, get some of the other politicalies involved in this conversation, like the mayor, do, do what is the lieutenant governor? But the lieutenant governor probably thinks just like the governor thinks. But like someone else to say, to shed some light on this, because if light doesn't keep shining, then they keep pushing us in darkness. I've, I've, I've written I've written our senators in Washington, D.C. I've written our House of Representatives of, in Washington, D.C. I've written state leaders. Man, I've written so many people but you'll be surprised at how when it comes time to make real change, Correct. how far and few between you can find folk willing to stand, <laughs> sir. It's just, it's, it's, um, it's, 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 it's sad. It's, it's sad. sad. It's, it's sad. Um, it's, 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 it's very sad, sir. And so I'm all for getting them to talk. But a lot of times, how many times have you heard anybody come forward and share the way Reverend Jones is sharing about this matter? Zero. Almost never. Yeah. I've never heard it myself. Right. You know, and, and that's because folk are afraid for what reason? You know, man doesn't control my life. Jesus controls my life. Mm -hmm. And if I'm speaking truth, I know he's with me. And so we got to stop being afraid. I'm talking about our community right now. Correct. Yeah. The cream of the crop, man. People, we, the, our, our, our community has educated, has given all kind of advantages mm -hmm. and opportunities. Some right. some people my, my neighborhood, when I grew up down in the deep south, man, them people didn't even make it out of the neighborhood. But some of us have been blessed by God to have a community that support us every mm -hmm. step of the way. And then when we reach the big issue, but we got to try and move mightily to bring about justice and fairness. We're afraid. And, and that's a tragedy, my friend. Because when you're afraid of the devil, you ain't going nowhere. You've got to fight against evil and, 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 and systemic racism. Or it will not, as Reverend Burns said, it's not going anywhere without some fire in it. We've got to protest. we got to support us when we run. we got to we got to communicate with our, our government officials. We got to let them know, what is this a 21st century? What in the world is going on? And, and I think that's why when during the summer and whenever the protesters were out moving and walking, I said, this is not doing anything to me because it, we are, our battles are still on the court steps. Our battle is still in the legislative. It is not in these streets. They're not caring about these streets or some Walgreens burning down. They're t they're capturing the courts, and they did it. Well, let's look at it. Trump appointed the most judges I've ever seen. Yeah, ever seen, and it's like, no one it's ever saying. no one said anything about it. It was just went whoosh, right through. And the voting, um, you better believe the voting book plays a major part in changing things. And uh, we came out in a beautiful way for Biden. And I hope we continue to come out going forward because these other positions in the Senate and the House, these are critical positions for us to keep the majority to just have a, a leadership that is sensitive to the people who put them there. Sir. That's the thing, sensitive to the people. If we could just have persons sensitive to the people, I'm not really too concerned about what color they are. But if you're right, not right, sensitive right. to the people, I'm a little that's bit right. concerned about that. <laughs> right, right. And it's never about skin color. Let me no, very clear. Right? No. It's not, not, not ethnicity, none of that stuff. Not where you were born. None of that. This is about what is just and fair. And let me tell you something. My elementary school child can know when something is unfair. Mm -hmm. You know, and so we, we know what this is, sir. We can stop fooling around. We know exactly what this is. Anytime you constantly making decisions in favor of Caucasians, regardless of whether they right or wrong, so that's systemic racism, you know. And this thing going on with the judicial nominating commission, sir. This thing is wicked, bro. It, there's no excuse for it. And I let me say this on publicly: I challenge any judge, any legislator, any layperson to debate me on this yesterday, because nobody can justify this in the 21st century, excluding a Reverend Jones and all this diverse, multi-legal knowledge experience, and putting a Caucasian on a bench with a year and a half in private practice. That's preposterous. And nobody can justify this. Now, challenge anybody anywhere on, in the world to debate this because you can't justify this, sir. There's no excuse for this wickedness and this unfairness, sir. It's a disgrace before God. So, if, if you want to help people who are living in different states who may listen to this in different places, what give them a little step by step what they should be watching out for 
to see where their courts are going. Yes. One of the things you want to do is you want to talk to lawyers from our community because, see, we, 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 get, we, we're right on the front line. So we're looking at this all the time. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, many of us are afraid to even share it or say anything about it. We've been looking at this for years and won't do anything. So the first thing you want to do, you want to try and make sure you communicate with the National Bar Association. Mm -hmm. Bar associations where our, where our community are part of it and a major part of and talk to the lawyers. You might want sometime at the National Bar Association. I belong to the National Bar Association. I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm an officer. I'm the chair of the law and religion section. And sometimes we will have um, uh, openings for lay people to come in and experience our co our conventions. That's that's a good idea if you can get there. So you you hear some stories, my friend. You you might cry. Mm. Some of the unfairness and justice that we see in uh, in the courts today in the 21st century. You, you you won't believe it. And so that's the first thing I would do. Uh, Talk to the lawyers from our community, the National Bar Association, communicate with the National Bar Association. Find out what's really going on, because many times if we don't know, we're not moved to do anything. To do anything, correct. But so we got to get informed first. Right. Get informed. There, of course, there's some wonderful books out there to, re to read about uh, systemic racism, things of that nature. I would do that. But one of the main things I will make sure I do is you watch the judiciary. The judiciary in your community should be, should be representative of the people that it serve. So in Anna the County, where I live, about a third of the community is non-Caucasian. Correct. On a third of Anna the County, it's nearly all Caucasian. So my tax dollars are supporting that court. <laughs> so how are you going to exclude me? That's taxation without representation. One of the most offensive ideas in all of democracy. Right. Yeah. And so look at the mix of the court. Look at the community and the court. The court should serve to, to reflect the community that it serves. There's no way in the world you should have a, 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 a community that's half African American and all the judges are Caucasian. You know, so that's what you call systemic racism. So that's what I would do. Communicate with judges from our, uh, excuse me, with attorneys from our community. Uh, get some information about the National Bar Association. And also look at the mixture of the court compared to the population. Those are some things you have to do because until we are a part of the decision-making process and not just the recipient all the time, it's going to be very difficult to get changed, sir. And I always say this, no matter what I say here or if you ever hear Reverend Jones speak, don't forget Reverend Jones said you need Jesus for real in your life mm -hmm. because this is a battle with evil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, you know, but against the powers, yeah. powers against the rules of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's not about the people. It's about the devil using those people to be unfair. And that's a force that we definitely have, we have to come with one a spiritual force and we have to come with a, a mental force. And I yes, think and, and I think that's where fear stops us. I think when people say they believe, do they really if they could have fear? Is that a question right. that's is right. is that a, can can a person say I believe and yet still have fear? Is that possible? Sir, it's it's, it's very difficult to to look at a person like that as either saved or mature in Christ. Either one, either you're not saved or you're not mature. I'm going to give you a good example. I had some years ago, I had this, uh, I was representing this guy, he told me there was a lady who worked where he worked and she needed some help. I said, well, you know, he said, could we have lunch and talk? I said, sure. So it's just a company, man, it's just got, she like two master's degrees, got all this experience and everything under the world you could think of. The, the supervisor, like 30 people, and they brought a Caucasian in there who just graduated from college the day before yesterday and made her a supervisor. So the lady, is she just distraught about this thing? Mm. So I'm trying to talk to her, man. Her head is down. She can't look me in the eyes. I said, sister, I said, sister, what's going on? Sister? And, and she couldn't even talk. She was so beaten down and so hurt behind this thing. Now, she got all kind of degrees and experience. And so you can't even, it was incalculable what she knew. So I said, sister, I said, I need you to lift your head up. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Well, they know what they did. I said, well, what did they do? Yeah. Well, they know what they did. I said, sister, I said, listen, I said, I can't represent you. I said, because you have got to be able to say that they put that woman in a position over yeah. you because her skin is white and mm -hmm. kept you up because your skin is black. Right. I said, you cannot be afraid to verbalize what's going on. How can I represent you when you can't even say what's going on? And so she she lifted her head up. And she, she, so she finally was able to articulate. I said, well, I'll tell you what, Reverend Jones is going to pray about this. You know, make sure God give me approval to represent you and I'll get back with you. So I prayed about it. God gave me approval. I went back to represent her. And it took me. It took me a long time to get this woman just hold her head up and, and, wow. and, and realize what we're in the middle of. So I, I got, once I got involved in the matter, once God gave me the approval, I was coming in there with guns blowing. I right, mean, guns right. blasting. You know that. So I go in there. So I'm fighting for I, I the final lawsuit on behalf. We, the EOC, the whole nine yards, we fighting tooth nail. And one day she finally said to me, she said, Reverend Jones, 
1957, I was at Pennsylvania University and Dr. Martin Luther King came to our university and I was over at his club and we had him to come and speak. She said, after we spoke, or after he spoke, excuse me, she said, we took him out to dinner, him and Coretta Scott King. She said that we were talking to Dr. King and his wife and we were asking him, Dr. King, tell us a little bit about the about the march, about the marches and the sit-ins. And she said, Dr. King leaned back and he started to talk to them about the brutality and the beatings and the whippings and the spit on these people sitting at the, at the, at the counters and at these restaurants. She said, he was talking about something that was so horrific. She said, but his spirit was so calm. She said, he spoke with such clarity, such calmness of spirit, but he was talking about things that made your skin crawl. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And she said, and I told her, I said, I said, sister, I said, Dr. King will be turning his grave if he knew you were afraid mm-hmm. to fight this fight. And after she told me that, and I shared that with her, homegirl lifted her head up, bro, and it was no more tiptoeing in the field with her. And we went on. It took us about 10 years before we won that case, but she got back there and got it all back. Good for her. Good but for I you. said all that just say, man, yeah. this fear will make you incapable of doing that which you're capable of doing we got to get rid of the spirit in our community sir and and i've been working on that's one of the things i like to work on a lot is try to get rid of this fear help people understand the science of fear understand the history of their fear because if you don't know where your fear comes from it just keeps right. reliving it just keeps right, going right. over and over and over and many of us are afraid in our community of, of dealing with ungodly wicked white folk you know if you if you ungodly ain't no fear the man of god and if you wrong you are my mother used to tell me what's going on. When you're wrong, you're wrong. <laughs> when you're wrong, you're wrong. That's what my mother used to tell us when that children were growing up. And so if, I, if I'm coming in court against you, you're wrong, you better tie your shoe strings tight. Because I'm coming in the name of Jesus, and I will be thoroughly researched and prepared. And so we have got to get those in our community, especially the cream of the crop, to not be fearful. Not sir. be fearful. Because things not going to change if we don't get this fear out of the cream of the crop I'm talking about. Those that our community has nurtured and helped and educated. We cannot be afraid. How can the community be helped if the cream of the crop is afraid? And that's a major problem, sir. Because they don't believe. They, no don't, doubt. Tru- they don't truly believe. If they believe, they wouldn't be afraid. You, you, yeah. it's, it's like we used to say this in the service. If you believe in the man next to you, you believe in what we're doing. I'm not talking about the act of what we're doing. We're talking about us, me and you together. There is yes. no fear. There's trust and it's moving sure. on. That's sure. it. Sure. Sure. Brother Ricky Nelson, I'm just going to say thank you. We need to talk more about this. Again, this is an enlightenment type of thing. This is about a judicial process that they're trying to create a closed voting issue about a appointing judge. This is about um, not having representation of the community and equality. This is about systemic racism in the judiciary process. This is this is about a lot of things that just, it's right there at the pinnacle. It's like right at the crossroads. And if they get this passed, if they pass this legislative bill and they close these proceedings, we're, I, I don't, I, we're, we will be out. out. Well, I'll be speaking against that on tomorrow, sir. Because I've, I've sent them a, a written statement. And I will be speaking out against that on tomorrow. This is going to be like my fourth time. The first three times I'm down in Indianapolis, I took time for my schedule to go down there to try to figure out what in the world you trying to pass this unwise, dumb bill for. And I, I didn't say dumb there, but I certainly tore it apart legally and factually to show how this is a terrible idea. And I think they had the chief judge who was there pushing it. I said, no matter who's pushing it, it's a terrible idea. It's a, ter- it's a bad it's idea. It's still a terrible idea. Right. It's still a terrible idea. And I'm going to speak against that on tomorrow as well. Sir. So you go down to the open session tomorrow to talk about this bill? It's going to be on. It's going to be online. It's going to be online tomorrow. But the previous years I went, I always went, actually went down to yeah, the okay. before. Yeah, because I was asked to go down there because it, the, I, the, the, it's just such a terrible idea. If you got a, if you got systemic racism in the judiciary, what are you doing trying to remove contested elections? You're really trying to put you a hit. stamp of approval right, on, on a major problem. On it. That's really what you're doing. And so you gotta you gotta be informed about what's going on to see this stuff because Satan is slick, sir. Send me the link so I want to watch it. It's it's at what mid afternoon, isn't it? Yeah, yes, at one thirty. Yeah, well, send me the link yeah. and I'll and I'll see if I can get in there because if they allow me in. Absolutely, sir. No problem at all. Thank you. You want to pray us out, please? Absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> According to Isaiah forty four and six, Lord, you said to us, "I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God." We bow to you as the only God, and we thank you for your Son Jesus Christ, who died for us on Calvary's cross. Lord, we thank you for this time of sharing this time of enlightenment, 
for using your servant, O God, to speak clearly and boldly about what is right and what is wrong. I ask that you touch hearts, touch minds, encourage your people, God, to know that keep their knees at the feet of Jesus and stand up with courage fearlessly to fight against that which is wicked and wrong. Lord, I ask that you continue to be with us every day and every way, because I know that way everything will be okay. Mm -hmm. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Thank God. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much, Ricky, brother Ricky. You have a good night. God bless you. We're going to be in communication now. Yes, sir. Okay, God bless. God bless.